All right, today we are talking about veteran readiness and employment. I am your host, Benjamin Kraus, VA accredited attorney and a journalist. We are coming in to this particular uh, Q&A Friday a little bit later than I thought because we had a, uh, I was giving a public comment to the Federal Advisory Committee uh, responsible for the VA Caregiver Act, and so I wanted to make a point to uh, to do that and to try to provide feedback to that population here. I'm going to put a quick comment in the um, thing here. We are live in the Facebook group talking about VRD issues. Tune in now question mark there we go no not question mark exclamation mark um, okay so that is uh going out there and uh, if you happen to have any kinds of uh questions or comments or concerns gripes you know whatever you want to do um make sure th uh, hey there hey derek good to see you. i see you this is great okay so things appear to be working uh that is excellent news i love it so uh, what we're going to be talking about today is whether uh, veter veteran readiness and employment counselors, do they mislead or uh, misrepresent or confuse on purpose, uh, make false statements to veterans? This is a topic in our uh, Facebook group. So if you're not, if you're watching this on YouTube or you're watching this on LinkedIn, uh, I suggest that you go into the, the comment section uh, where I can put comments underneath the uh, video and, and check out our group. The group is uh, almost 40,000 people now. We're coming up uh, on, on that number. It's been around for nearly, we're almost 15 years. And this has been a project that I've been working on since well before I was an attorney and uh, probably even yeah anyway a long time ago i think it was 2009 when i created the group and the reason for this and why, why it's relevant is that at that point in time in 2009 there was not a lot of public information about veteran readiness and employment then called vocational rehabilitation and employment there wasn't a lot of information available about it at all it just wasn't uh, when you talk to a vso um, like at that point in time, I had spoken with one of the individuals at Disabled American Veterans and they wanted to write a story and they thought it was great that I uh, graduated from Northwestern University and VRD paid for my uh, for me to go there. And uh, then I started to get into some of the problems that I had experienced as you know, through the program I was like, well, you know, and then, but then these other things happened and I got stuck with a multi thousand dollar hospital bill and then they you know wouldn't approve my benefits right away and they said some stuff to me that maybe come to find out wasn't true and you know so on and so forth and i don't think they published the story uh so it really got me thinking at that point in time i'm like well wait did do not a lot of people understand how vrne works and and that sometimes the program itself maybe doesn't work the way it's supposed to uh or at least you know veterans are kind of being maybe misled by uh these senior um counselors right so they're called a vocational rehabilitation counselor most of them have at least a master's degree if not a doctorate and have some kinds of certifications uh depending on you know their their nuanced background and so these are individuals that are considered to be very well trained who do certain assessments who uh, do research on people like veterans who can uh, create forensic evidence based on their meetings so they're trained in doing this and are frequently hired by defense you know, defense firms and insurance companies when a person has a claim for workers' comp, actually, which is something I didn't know at the time. And so, anyway, point is that you have to be kind of aware of uh, their background and, and what may be going on and, you know, whatever, uh, when you're getting information from these folks. And down the road, as I became more educated, eventually went to law school and, and became a VA accredited attorney, now I help veterans become doctors, lawyers, and, and uh, business executives through the program because it's, it's important. We need more veterans to be leaders in uh, commerce and industry and everything else, you know. And we have one program in the Department of Veterans Affairs that is designed specifically to help disabled veterans become leaders 
and yet we get jacked around. And so we're going to talk about that today. I want to talk about whether veterans are being jacked around on purpose or misled by vocational counselors, information being withheld from by vocational counselors. Does this happen? And so uh, to address this, I'll just say from my own example, uh, my own personal experience, I was misled by the program and the counselor that I spoke with. And only many years later did I learn of this when I finally requested a copy of my file. And in the file, there were emails between that counselor and the senior counselor in, in their chain of command, talking about what kinds of benefits I should have been approved for. And I remember at that time I had asked to, I said something like, well, I want to be a lawyer, blah, blah, blah. And so I was told that Voc Rehab wouldn't do that, right? Or at least this is, hey, Sarah, good to see you. I was told that this was, you know, well, that's ridiculous. Why would a program ever pay for you to go to law school? I was like, oh, okay, well, that's, what if I want to be a lawyer? You know, I mean, what else am I going to do? If that's what I want to be, there's not a lot of other jobs out there that are like being a lawyer, you know, it's pretty unique. Anyway, so I was told this, years later, I get my file, and in the file, I see this email exchange back and forth with the counselors. What I was told in the field was not exactly what was being relayed back and forth between leadership and uh, what I was hearing. And so what I was actually, you know, hearing, obviously, is that, well, we don't do that, you know, or we can't do it for you. Well, I didn't know anything about this uh, exchange back and forth, and come to find out, the, the leader in that area... Uh, had said that they could in fact do it for me and here's how and they explained it and then the counselor had relayed back oh he's aware that we're not going to do that for him so don't worry about all this you know blah 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 and i was like oh okay um hey bamboo i see a uh, question can you okay i will i will try i can't guarantee that i'll be able to touch on that but i'll do the best that i can hey what up man good to see you so uh, i'll do the best that i can and then Sarah, I will, I'll look at this. Um, okay, I'll get to yours uh, later. So uh, the, there are some questions here that I'm gonna answer of veterans that put their questions into the group the night before. And so if you're watching this today or you watch a recording of it on YouTube or elsewhere, just know that in uh, YouTube, yeah, everything's been good, man, appreciate it. Um, so I'm gonna put in, in the Facebook group the day before uh, a request for questions. And then those questions are definitely the questions I'm gonna do my best to get to during the live stream. And I just want you to know that uh, that's what we'll, do, you know, that's how I do it. And so go join our group. Note that when you join the group, you gotta answer all the questions. That includes giving your email. So just be aware, your email, you gotta give it to us and otherwise you don't get in. So there you go. But we have about uh, almost 40,000 people. It's a great group. The people in it are very passionate, lots of doctors, lots of lawyers, uh, people with an MBA, dentists, like you name it, they're in the group. Uh, many of us have been through the program and some people had a great experience, others didn't. So I just, I would encourage you to join the group. It's in the, hey Sarah, awesome. Uh, so anyway, uh, I won't plug the group anymore. Um, so point is that veterans are misled very frequently. And so one of the things that I commented on in the group uh, they got a lot of feedback from a lot of veterans. Let's see if I can pull it up here. So the question I posed to the group, this is yesterday, why do so many veterans trust their VRC, so that's short for Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor, why do so many veterans trust their VRC when a vocational goal is rejected verbally? Okay, again, rejected verbally. So that means the veteran says, I want to do X, and the counselor says, no, we won't do that for you, or whatever the excuse is. Instead, we want you to do this. We'll give you a bachelor's degree, but otherwise, nah, we're not going to do all that. So uh, having said this, you know, this is what I posted to the group. There were 47 comments, and the post reached over 4,000 veterans in the group. Uh, and again, it's a private group, right? So that's a pretty significant chunk of veterans saw that. And they responded uh, quite a few about their own experiences or why they believe veterans, you know, just trust the verbal statements of their counselors. And it came down really to two, the, the feedback was generally two things. First is that these counselors are in a position of trust and there's a power uh, discrepancy between the veteran and a knowledge discrepancy as well 
between the veteran and everyone else. And uh, so the counselor just, we believe what they say most of the time. We don't not believe them. Why would somebody mislead you um, on purpose? That's amazing. But I can tell you as an attorney that handles these appeals in my law firm, on a regular basis, I see counselors mislead veterans all the time. They either do it on purpose or through act of omission. Sometimes they just are lazy and they don't do the paperwork. You know, so there's a lot of different different reasons why it could happen. However, I am of the opinion, and I know I'm saying this about my federal government, so watch out. I am of the opinion that there are many counselors in this program that intentionally mislead veterans because they are lazy and they don't want to look for the right answer, or they don't want to fill out the paperwork, or they're just hoping you go away and they just don't want to deal with it. I'm convinced that that is true from my experience. And so I'm inferring this based on the multitude of different cases that I've handled and the now, you know, nearly 40,000 veterans in our Facebook group that I founded, right? There's a lot of veterans, okay? Uh, where there's, there's a unifying experience between these veterans and frequently it comes back to the VRC providing false and erroneous information to the veterans. This just, it happens. And oh, by the way, there's no accountability in the VA. So uh, they just do whatever they want. And if you wanna go sue the VA in court through traditional methods, like going to a district court over them, you know, giving you bad information, like in a tort, you can't do it. You can't do it. Just can't. And if you want to hire an attorney, going to VA knowing that you might be misled, knowing that they might be developing evidence against you in this forensic process, the VSOs in this country and the Department of Veterans Affairs have lobbied Congress and also themselves to believe that a veteran should not have a right to hire an attorney whenever they want. Did you know that we are one of the only, if not the only, populations in this country? that cannot hire an attorney whenever we want. Amazing, so when you took your uniform off, you could no longer hire an attorney whenever you want. And if the government owes you money, nope, there's very se severe and strict restrictions on your ability to get legal counsel in America, you know, supposedly a place where you have a constitution, supposedly and supposedly a First Amendment, supposedly a Second Amendment, all these other things. And yet, you know, for a long time, veterans have been treated like second-class citizens. If you're an illegal alien or an accused criminal, you can hire an attorney whenever you want. Not if you're a veteran, okay? So if you're a veteran, we get less than criminals, less than illegal immigrants. What do we get? you get, according to the establishment, which is the Department of Veterans Affairs and its quasi-government entities, which I call legacy VSOs, through those groups, you get to, you know, talk to somebody who's not a lawyer, who's not trained through legal systems like a lawyer, who is not licensed, who likely doesn't carry malpractice insurance, who likely didn't go to school for three years, after an undergrad to learn how to do this and then in turn practices in this area within their state or wherever they're at. So it's important to know that as a veteran you have less rights than every other American and illegal immigrants in this country. Veterans have less rights. Less rights folks. Remember that. We are have less rights in this country than illegal immigrants and criminals. Okay? Criminals. Got it? Now imagine if you're a criminal and, um, you know, or you're an accused criminal, rather, because we don't want to assume anyone's guilty, right? Because we still live in America, right? America, uh, not with a K. So America, and we live in a country where we have a constitution and supposedly we have these rights. Supposedly, right? Okay. And so imagine if you're accused of a crime. And imagine if you cannot hire a lawyer until after the prosecutor finds you guilty in front of a judge, you know. So after you're prosecuted, oh, the judge comes back, yeah, you're guilty, son, you know, the jury. And they're like, well, you're going to go to prison for 20 years. You'll have to appeal it later. Good luck. Hope you can find an attorney at that point. Well, they've already developed a case against you. They've already developed all the evidence. The record is ostensibly sealed. 
and, and that's where you're stuck with, you know, so you didn't have uh, the benefit of legal counsel through that process, if that were the case, right? But fortunately in America, you have a right to an attorney, right? You have a right to hire whomever you want, normally. You have a right to contract. You have a right to associate with whomever you want. You have a right to speak whenever you want, supposedly. Except in a few select circumstances, including if you're a veteran and you want to go get benefits from the VA and the VA may owe you money, Oh, well, wait a minute. Whoa. Uh, we've decided that, you know, no veteran should be have to pay to get their benefits, so therefore no veteran can pay to, to, to get help to get their benefits. Now, that's an interesting little switcheroo, right? Now, the VSOs are very happy about this system because the VSOs uh, use, in part, and I know this because I've been through the system, so I know personally, I wasn't always an attorney, uh, I don't just play one on YouTube, right? I, I went through this process as a disabled veteran who had not been to college yet. And I got inferior help from multiple VSOs. Not just one, but multiple. Multiple. My theory is that if I had a VSO from the onset when I first got out, or not a VSO, rather a, lo a lawyer, an attorney, uh, my benefits probably would have been sorted out. I probably wouldn't have had to fight with the VA for 10 years. 10 years. And I probably would have been approved for the goal of lawyer straight away because we didn't know what was going on and it would have been sorted out. Well, I didn't have that right. And so as a consequence of that, my access to the full pantheon of benefits to which I'm entitled uh, was restricted, right? So it was restricted. It took me 10 years to get there, right? And I could not hire an attorney. I tried. I could not hire one. I had to become my own attorney, okay? Had to become my own attorney, and uh, wow, right? And and similarly with VRNE, right? It was a heck of heck of a lot of work, right? Heck of a lot of work. So additionally, so compounding all this, you don't have a right to legal counsel whenever you choose because you're a veteran. But you served. Why would you ever have a right to have an attorney help you against the federal government? Because clearly the federal government never engages in wrongdoing. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. So anyway, point is, uh, we all know that they do. The federal government, including the VA, engages in wrongdoing. Sometimes, I think, on purpose. And that's my opinion from what I've seen uh, and what I know and what I hear. You know, I've been in this space for, for now two decades uh, as a veteran who then later became an attorney. You know, I've been an attorney for 10 years. So I've seen it. I know it goes on, right? I'm certain of it uh, in my bones. Um, and I've seen the documents that support this. So point is, Going back to this other thing, which is why do veterans trust the VRC, right? Why? It's because uh, first we have the power differential, but then in addition to that, veterans are, we're trained, we are broken down, broken down. We have our psyches broken down through CRT, basically, cognitive uh, therapy, but cognitive uh, disturbances that cause us to meld into the group during basic training through all military training. And then you become part of this unit in the military and then you get out and bloop, the training wheels come off. You still believe that you can trust everybody and you'll take them at their word and all that other stuff. So you do that with the VA. Come to find out that's not true. And if it's not written down, it didn't happen. So suddenly now we have this system where mm, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. So oops, sorry, buddy. We don't care what the VRC said. You know, oh, they, they said you could go be a lawyer and now you got a new VRC and the new VRC is like, oh, sorry, Chuck. I've decided uh, you're a little undergrad and criminal justice is just fine. Go get a job and, you know, if you haven't found a job in two years, come back to us. That's how we treat our veterans, by the way. Like, what? Uh, wow. You know, you would think that of any population where we, um, uh, where we, I appreciate the kudos there. So anyway, I'm just, I'm kind of going off on this because I just, I saw this this week and it's, you know, some of these, in my opinion, um, individuals that, you know, the names kind of cycle through VA. And I see similar cases coming from different veterans about the same person or VRC or same office. And I know the problems there. And so anyway, we're, we're just kind of getting to the bottom of it. And man, I'll tell you, we just, we, we see over and over again, veterans go in, they have no idea what's going on. I have talked to VA. So one thing to know about VA uh, they act as if only nonprofits can help veterans, but meanwhile, they pay billions of dollars every year to government contractors who, in my opinion, 
could give two rips about most veterans anyway, unless you're a general or somebody like that that's a lobbyist for them. But, you know, they don't really give a rip about us, the lay people, the little people, and, you know, the grass, grassroots folks. And so uh, when it comes to... Um, Well, anyway, I, I, I'm not going to get into all that. So uh, point is, the VA gives a lot of money out to these massive corporations. Um, they don't hire little companies like mine to help educate veterans. They'd rather pay Booz Allen Hamilton or these other companies tens of millions of dollars to educate veterans about stuff and give them complete garbage, which I've seen. I've been cataloging this for years. They just don't want veterans to really know what's going on. They want to keep us in the dark. They treat us frequently like criminals, and that's the reality. You know, the more veterans that are in the system, the bigger the gravy train, but they also have to have this other paddle over here. Boop, boop, boop. We don't want you to know how it works because we don't trust you because you're a dirty veteran. Why? You know, we don't really want you to know what's going on. We don't want you to be a leader. You might upset the apple cart, man. Why? You know? And so we're seeing this, like uh, we just did the Caregiver Federal Advisory Committee, um, uh, public comment through uh, a nonprofit that I've been working uh, working with, and um, they're you know changing the ethics rules. They let a bunch of people in that are kind of grassroots and really have the veterans' heart in mind when they're giving the recommendations or whatever. And the VA is like, oh, that's uh, that's scary. Uh, we want to limit you. <laughs> so anyway, you know they don't want the grassroots folks to get any kind of control or have any kind of say. Because, you know, it's not the same thing that people are being told at the country club or on the golf course or on the yacht or in the private jet. You know, that story is a whole lot different than the story that, you know, that I'm telling you, the, the reality of it, you know, the day-to-day -day of it. And, you know, we're dealing with uh, this. Now we have this. You know, we have a runaway VA and a runaway federal government and, you know, no accountability except for the little people. Want to keep the little people in line. We don't want their, you know, voice to get out. We want to censor them. We want to keep them quiet. We don't want, you know, any decision maker to really know what's going on. It's all roses and gumdrops and chocolate river, you know, chocolate milk rivers and gumdrop rainbows, right? I mean, that's really kind of the story that they want everyone to think, you know, because they want everyone to think that, you know, they're treating veterans well. Because, you know, it's hard to recruit for the next world war if we don't treat veterans well, <laughs> obviously. So we got to make sure that everybody thinks that we're doing doing all right with them. I mean, uh, how else do you justify $200 billion in budget? You know, do you know that the VA uh, has received a trillion dollars in the past five years? A trillion dollars. So I want you to ask yourself, am I getting a trillion dollars worth of benefits from the VA? Is this how I'm being treated? Does this seem like the kind of service I would get from a private sector, for example? I mean, maybe it would be. I don't know. I can't speak to that because I know sometimes there's some pretty shady companies out there. But, uh, you know, the point is that, you know, are we getting what we're paying for as taxpayers? You know, and I, I think that the answer is no. <laughs> so then we want to know, well, where's the money going? Uh, I don't know. It's going here. It's going there. Oh, it's uh, elections coming up, you know, so we got to figure out an easy way to, you know, circumvent the system so that we can get that money over to the, you know, favored politician from either party, right? Because both parties are kind of in on it, in my opinion. So um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of the gist of where I'm going with this. So the point is that we have a lot of veterans. Veterans are being misled. Uh, veterans just believe the agency without demanding uh, something in writing. So if you take nothing away from this, here's the one thing. Always in writing, always in writing, always in writing. If you ask VA something like, like I did, hey, I want to be a lawyer, and you don't demand that they give you a decision in writing, then it didn't happen. So you got to put it in writing. Make them do it. And you may still get denied. But sometimes you won't. Sometimes they're going to be like, oh, I don't want to put that in writing. That sounds dumb. And so then you might win. So food for thought, okay? So sometimes when you put things in writing, you win. So, you know, something to think about. But anyway, uh, that's the general gist of it. So if you happen to join the group and you see this, and I hope you do, but if you don't, that's cool. We'll still be doing these uh, Facebook Lives and whatnot. But, uh, you know, and broadcasting it to LinkedIn and 
wherever else we can get the stream to, to sync up with. But um, anyway, so that's the gist of it, you know. And, and by the way, you know, just so that people know, I am a lawyer. I am VA accredited. I represent veterans when they're wrongly denied veteran readiness and employment benefits. So if you get a denial and you're like, man, I really wish I could have an attorney look at this who knows what they're talking about, we're happy to look at your denial and not charge you to look at it in a case eval. So look below. You can just go right to the website. Boop, you know, if you want, if you have questions about it, just go there. I have a team of people that look at things. Okay. So happy to look at it for free, not charge you. And, and you know what else? Unlike a VSO, we'll respond to your emails and calls. Hmm? How about that? You know, because we're professionals, you know, imagine fancy VA won't call you back. VA doesn't respond to your emails. That culture, you'll turn to the VSOs frequently. They don't call you back either. And I love the VSOs. Some of them are great. I belong to some, right? I support these guys because I know at the end of the day, some of what they're doing is great. However, handcuffing veterans as if we live in communist Soviet Union type stuff, right? Handcuffing our ability to hire a lawyer, I think that's wrong. And I think that they're wrong for being on board with that and participating in that system. Because the only real winner there is them with more members and the VA because they're paying less in benefits because so many veterans statistically walk away without appealing and they believe that whatever the VA wrote down must be true. And so they don't question it. So food for thought, you know, cost saving measure, I think it is, but that's my take on it. You know, uh, I'm sure that you have some counselors out there that are great. I've talked to some of them. I know they're great. I know there are many that care about vets, but I also know that there's a lot of old stooges in that, in that system that uh, mislead folks and give people bad information. I think it's sometimes intentionally. Sometimes it's just because they're incompetent, lazy, or poorly trained. But either way, I can't imagine how somebody with a master's degree would be poorly trained, you know? That doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, you know, it is the federal government, and I guess, you know, if you're making between 80 and 100,000 to do these decisions on a regular basis, somehow you get a pass. So, uh, amazing. Anyway, so I want to talk about uh, two questions here. I had a question from Mark Dallas. He's in the group. And I really appreciate, you know, again, the question. Uh, if you do have a question, type it in. If you're on LinkedIn, I probably won't see your question. I see it, it keeps dinging. I don't know how to shut that off. Er, I'm going to turn down. Um, maybe maybe this will help. Um, so hopefully that will help and, and you won't hear the dinging. Can everyone still hear me? I think you can. Okay, I see. It looks like we're still hearing me. Okay. So um, I shut off the dinger, so that's annoying. Uh, hopefully it won't bother anybody else moving forward. So uh, questions. Uh, Mark asked a question, actually three, and they were really good, so I wanted to, to mention this. So uh, Mark asked, why isn't the program standardized? So I'm going to provide, probably going to do a longer segment on this. I have evidence that explains why, and it's through a FOIA that – uh, basically uh, came out, I think it was in 2019, where there was an audit uh, in VRD because, come to find out, each VRD division at each regional office has its own unique local policies. Those policies are supposed to be consistent with the M28C and the uh, regulation, right? But sometimes they're not. And what we're running into very frequently when it comes to these, like, non-standardized adjudications and other oddball behaviors. Sometimes what we're seeing is just a nefarious policy that is at the root of a veteran being wrongly denied. I'm going to say it again. Sometimes what we're seeing is a local policy that's inconsistent with the M28C or inconsistent with the regulation or statutes. And what we're seeing is uh, you know, in my opinion, malfeasance, which is basically they're, they're carrying out supposedly the intent of Congress without doing what Congress says. So I wanted to point out one other thing while I say this because it's important and worth knowing. So one thing that a lot of veterans don't realize is that the, and I'm, I'm just pulling it up here, but there is one, one, one statute that really explains what VRND is supposed to be doing. And it could be knowing this, 
could be the difference between you winning or losing your benefits, okay? Just one. There's, I mean, there's a lot, right? Don't get me wrong. There's a whole bunch of these, but there's one statute, okay? And this, this carries into a regulation that's basically the same. And what that is, is 38, this is in the group, again, so if you want to go to the group, it's in, it's in the forum, you can see it. It's 38 USC section or chapter 3100, so 3100, okay? And this reads as follows, and I quote, okay, I'm quoting here. The purposes of this chapter, meaning chapter 31, okay, so VR and E, the purposes of this chapter are to provide for all services and assistance, all services and assistance, I'm going to say it again, all services and assistance necessary, I'm going to say it again, necessary, necessary to enable veterans with service-connected disabilities to achieve maximum independence in daily living, maximum independence in daily living, and, and to the maximum extent feasible to become employable and to obtain and maintain suitable employment. The last part I'm going to reread. To the maximum extent feasible, comma, to become employable and to obtain and maintain suitable employment. To the maximum extent feasible. Not to the minimum extent feasible. Not entry-level employment, right? That's not what we're talking about. Maximum. And when it comes to the entry level, that is a myth that VA created that many counselors repeat to veterans that don't know. And so veterans take training at a lower level. They get lowballed. Training at a lower level, like an undergrad or an associate's degree or a certificate only, when they could have been approved to become a lawyer or a doctor or physician assistant or nurse practitioner or a psychologist or a professor. Or get an MBA, right? Okay, there's a whole host of things here, right? Lots of professions, lots of great professions, leadership professions. And instead, these dirtbags that do this confuse and convince veterans, fraudulently in my mind, to accept only entry-level employment, because that's all we do. At VRE, we're only there to get you a job. We don't care if it's at McDonald's or Walmart or as a forklift driver. You know, oh, lawyer? No, that's that's over the top. We don't do that. Well, my friends, they've been doing that for decades, helping people become lawyers. They just don't want you to know it, <laughs> okay? That's why they don't like me. That's why they don't like our group. That's why they don't like my website, disabledveterans.org. You know, that's why they don't want a lot of their employees talking to me. And I'm going to talk more and more to them, by the way, put out more videos so that their employees can see what they're supposed to be doing, and so that their employees can gauge whether or not they're engaged in fraud. Because you know what? The second that you know what you're supposed to be doing, well, you can't unknow that, right? Unless, of course, you have a horrible memory. So there's, you know, that. But otherwise, that's what I wanted to talk about there. Now, next question from Mark. Uh, somebody says, why is there so much confusion about private pilots licenses um well mark i wouldn't say that that confusion is accidental i would say oh, hang on a second the ai there is not focused on my, my head um so i wouldn't say that it's accidental about the confusion at least at the source uh, but you know getting a pilot's license a commercial pilot's license is expensive and so vrd uh, has made it a little more difficult because you have to be you know, usually, but, you know, there's, I'm sure, nuances to this. Um, the preference is that you have the personal pilot's license first, and then maybe they'll put in for your training, which is still a lot of money, 150 grand for all the different things, um, to become a personal, pers blah, 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 to become a commercial pilot. Very expensive. But there are exceptions to this, as far as I know, uh, as long as it's part of your education program, to obviously get to being a commercial pilot or something like that, uh, then then there's an exception. Why is there confusion about it? Because I think they want there to be confusion about it. It's expensive, and 
the fewer veterans that get approved for these expensive programs, then the, the better the numbers look at each regional office to the Office of Field Operations. And then that information gets relayed up to the Veterans Benefits uh, Undersecretary, you know. So the less money that they have to shell out, the better, right? So that's just how it works. That's the name of the game, man. The VA is a little more in my mind than an insurance company for the Department of Defense. They're like kind of workers comp, basically, for the Department of Defense, except they have their own hospitals and whatnot. But aside from that, that's, in my opinion, more or less what the VA is, a big insurance company that happens to have hospitals where they, you know, are data mining our, our information through medical research and researching, you know, on the back of vets. So, you know, there's that. Um, I'm just, I'm not happy with the VA right now. There's uh, just, it seems like shenanigan after shenanigan uh, going on with how they treat our data, how they treat our vets, you know, and it just seems clear to me that at the end of the day, most of these folks in leadership, I, I don't think they get it. And I don't think they really care about us. I think that we are there to justify an enormous budget to support other activities, uh, not necessarily caring for us. So, you know, that's, that's my take on it. And I'm willing to prove that uh, to anybody or argue that point to anybody who wants to step up and we're happy to do it. So anyway, um, then the next one is which regional officer? Okay, so uh, this veteran, Mark, is having also a hard time getting a hold of his counselor for urgent care. It's San Diego. Uh, so the way to, get, to figure this out would be to uh, either do a White House hotline query, which is now the VA hotline. Okay, it's no longer the White House hotline because they did away with it. Um, and then they rebranded just VA hotline or then the other is looking on the San Diego regional office website, look under leadership, get the, uh, I think it's Allison Johnson or something like that. Uh, anyway, uh, whoever the VRE officer is, and then do first name dot last name at va.gov. And that email will usually land in their inbox. So that's what I would do to reach that person. Uh, then another one, Abe or Abe, um, asks about retroactive reimbursement and filling out the form. I had some questions about it and no clue on how to fill it out. And I guess from my perspective, I'm like, well, you got all these fancy vocational rehabilitation counselors with their, you know, master's degree and 80000 a year, you know, salary. Ask them to do it, right? I mean, just uh, how, how do you do it, you know? Uh, they're supposed to help. And, you know, they frequently don't, and they make veterans try to figure it out ourselves. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that's my two cents there. So I wanted to, now I'm going to circle around. So those are the questions uh, for Mark and Abe um, from yesterday. So I wanted to make sure that I did my best to answer those questions. And then now I'm going to move on to, okay, we have a lot of good questions here. So I'm really thankful if you're, if you're watching this. And you're like, you know, I kind of have a question. Ask the question. Put it in the thing. Hit the little keyboard, you know, the little touchy thing with the buttons. And tip, 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 tip. You know, put in your question, okay? Uh, don't be a scaredy cat. And ask what the question is, okay? Um, so I'm going to go through these. And then I have to eat because I'm dying. I'm so hungry. Um, let's see here. Um, okay, so Sarah writes... Uh, here, I'm just going to put this on the screen so people can kind of see what the thing is. So Sarah writes, uh, I had a voc rehab counselor judge me for going to counseling and tried to tell me I couldn't go to social. Oh, okay. So I see this a lot. There's a couple offices that I'm not going to mention here that where I've seen um, veterans with mental health disorders, in my opinion, get denied that particular goal without sufficient evidence. So I see that quite a bit. Uh, there are some pretty famous um, psychologists who have um, done really well in, in, in research for psychology and other things. Despite having mental illnesses, there was even one I had found recently who is a veteran, uh, who I think he may have had service connection for bipolar disorder, but I might be wrong. Anyway, um, he's deceased now, but the point is that he um, was at the, at the front end of really uh, 
attacking discrimination against people with mental illness, which I think is still a challenge. And I think that the VA still engages in improper discrimination against veterans with certain disabilities. Uh, keep in mind that VRND by its very nature is forced to discriminate between people that can do jobs and can't do jobs. But there's also a difference between um, impermissible discrimination and permissible discrimination. And so that's where I think the line comes with VRD. Um, so I, I've seen where some of the VRCs believe that veterans with PTSD or other mental health uh, challenges shouldn't be a psychologist, and that's just wrong. You know, there are plenty of psychologists or social workers that get into the field because they had a certain experience, um, whether growing up or in the military or whatever the thing is, where they want to help people that went through the same exact experience, which makes them, by the way, very good at it. Um, uh, but I see some counselors, uh, you know, kick them out, even though, you know, it's, it's improper with insufficient rationale, you know, that doesn't comply with uh, 38 CFR 21.420 or 38 USC 5104 for notice requirements, you know, so they don't explain it with appropriate reasons and bases. So, uh, uh, so anyway, so I hope that helps, uh, that now let's see here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I know a lot of people watching this, if you are watching this, that you probably agree with uh, Sarah's perspective. Uh, the two things that I get lately have been, or the one is that, um, the VRCs act like uh, denial reps versus counselors. And so, I've been hearing this more multiple times uh, now. Whenever I hear something multiple times, it's like, huh, there must be a shift of some kind where now veterans are, are feeling or knowing about this term and calling the counselors just denial reps instead of uh, counselors and that they're, when they go in for the thing, they the initial evaluation, they believe that the VRC is supposed to help and to counsel, such as, you know, dig through your background, work with you to find relevant uh, evidence and then develop that evidence, which is actually what they're supposed to do. They just don't. <laughs> so there you go. There is a mystery tip of the day. Yeah, they just don't do that uh, most of the time. So um, yeah, appreciate the kudos here. Uh, that's kind of you. Uh, I appreciate that. And then we have, um, oh, <laughs> thanks, Gerald. Appreciate it. Um, what else here? Oh yeah, I'm so sorry about this. Okay, so this is somebody who's talking about how it was hard to find an attorney who could help uh, with with this, and it's true because of the cap with uh, FTCA. That again, VSOs are all on board for cap and fees for attorneys, you know, uh, because they think that what they do is apparently the same, and it's not. But uh, they believe and have support, you know, caps on this type of stuff. Well, because of those caps, you can't. It's hard to find an attorney willing to go against the VA uh, when it comes to med mail. And the VA knows that, which is, I think, also part of why it's so easy for them to do research on veterans, uh, medical research. So uh, it, it's hard for us to get access to justice. Again, you know, I mean, it's just a continuance of being in the service and, uh, you know, being mistreated in many ways where you don't have a voice there. And they get to do whatever they want to do to your body there, like forcing you to get the anthrax shot and other stuff, the COVID shot, you know, recently. And, um, you know, you don't have a choice over your body. They'll destroy your record and kick you out and uh, you won't be able to get a job or go to college, uh, depending on what kind of uh, discharge you get, you know. So it's real, real sad. So we have uh, one owl veteran here. I don't see who it was, but thank you. I appreciate that. Um Let's see here. Hugh asked, why does U.S. veterans have served in the country? Yeah, difficulty. Well, I, I think it's because they don't want us to access our benefits because it's expensive. So if the benefits system functions the way it should, the need would be much higher for funding to fund appropriate benefits. And uh, nobody wants that. They don't want to really... Uh, the the DOD, Department of Defense, does not want the cost of war to be as high as it truly is. 
and then they want to displace that cost onto the American public. Uh, you know, so we see this within the context of caregivers, people that provide care to their veteran, um, and the cost there in the community, you know, from having to provide care and support for a person that is severely disabled, it's, they don't, they don't want to pay for it, you know, and, and the, the cost is quite high. You know, if you were to go to an adult living facility, it would cost, uh, 10 to $12,000 a uh, month. And the VA doesn't want to pay that. So it's just how it is. Let's see here. So do, 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 another kudos. Thanks, man. I appreciate the support. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a, been a weird week. Let's see here. So what else? So another veteran, I, I don't know exactly who this is, but um, the person writes in, I feel like my counselor leaves me hanging. Last October I called. He said I'll get more info for the initial interview within the next month. It's already December. Yeah, pretty much. If you were a corporate, if, if I did this to my clients and, and blew them off like that, um, I could get in trouble. You know, you have to respond to your clients. But meanwhile, you look at like VSOs and they never pick up the phone. They don't respond to email. Um, VA employees frequently, same thing, you know, don't respond, you know, uh, because they don't have to. There's no accountability. So that's, you know, unfortunate, but that's just kind of how it is. So another veteran writes, can we talk about the low quality of DOD civilians? My VRE rep is always very hard to reach and unresponsive. Uh, as someone pushing for an MD, I'm constantly having to educate my rep and convince them I'm in <laughs> right. I had to prove they can send me to med school and am now currently trying to show my v, my rep VRE can pay for residency after me. Yeah, so they do pay for residency. There's uh, one veteran, uh, last name Johnson, in our group who was kind enough to post information about residency. I've helped veterans get approved for residency in appeals. It is true. Just be aware that no matter how great of an argue, you know, debater you might be or how articulate you might be, sometimes um, the treatment of a veteran compared to like when I go in to work on the same case, with, I could have the same argument. Mine would be, odds are more successful simply because, I mean, it, all things being equal, let's say, just because I'm an attorney and I'm a third part, you know, get, get kind of a third uh, perspective on it. Um, just because, you know, uh, I could argue exactly the same way sometimes. I mean, usually, obviously I, I do my own thing, but, you know, so I have my own method and madness to when it comes to how I do appeals. But, um, but I've also seen situations where veterans articulate exactly what I would articulate in that situation and they don't win simply because the VRC is not paying attention or they don't want to. And then when I get involved, they know that I may escalate it and get them in trouble. So, uh, you know. That's kind of how that works. Another person uh, may be extreme, but can I petition for my counselor to get fired or at least retrained recent? So the answer to this is yes, maybe, definitely maybe. Uh, so it's something I've thought about putting a guide on, um, like kind of calling it like the nuclear option. Uh, it's not something you want to do unless like there's nothing else left in your quiver of legal resources. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's ways to do it. Um, but I'll, it's hard to explain. I don't want to explain it here, but yeah, there's ways to do it with ethics or, um, certain types of complaints done a certain way. Um, where if a VRC gets a certain number of complaints in a certain period of time that are legitimate, then it can affect their performance uh, reviews. Or at least that's, you know, it could be different now, but I'm almost certain it's the same. I just don't know exactly what it is. So question number three, leadership page. Why isn't their contact information available? Because you are a criminal, buddy. You're a dirty veteran. They don't want to talk to you. That's why it's not available. Uh, that's why a lot of VRCs will not give out the, the email or contact information 
of leadership of their regional office, even though in my opinion they should have. Again, like I hate to keep hitting this horse here, but um, these people are supposed to be servants of veterans. They're serve they're public servants. That's what they're supposed to be. They don't act like that at all. Like at all. Um, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of seeing it. You know, I've been doing this for a long time as an advocate, and then I became an attorney, and the same problems are still persistent. It has not changed, uh, which leads me to believe it won't. And it also leads me to believe that it's like that on purpose. So I don't think they want veterans to be leaders in society, you know, at the core of it. Otherwise, they would fix the problems, right? Uh, the problems at this point it seem to be there on purpose. And, and the effect of problems like this uh, are that veterans walk away and they don't get the benefits that they're entitled to. However, on the flip side of that, what they don't realize is that for veterans that do complete the program in an ideal career, we pay a lot in taxes. They get the money back in taxes because we're optimally trained and creating value. And the VA just seems to miss that point, you know. It's in their best interest, the best interest of our country, to have veterans optimally trained. That is, assuming that you want veterans to be optimally trained, right, and to be leaders in society. If that's what you want, well, then you will pursue appropriate, you know, policies and objectives to get there. But if you don't want that, but you want to appear like you're doing it but not really do it, well, mission accomplished, you know. Mission accomplished. So, anyway, um... So that's uh, what the deal is about that and the internet and LinkedIn, uh, spot on. It's hard, hard to figure it out. And then um, let's see, Sherry Moore writes in, same thing happened to me, failed to allow me to complete my degree in only two courses. Oh, that's sad. All right, well, Sherry, if that's still affecting you, I would encourage you to submit a supplemental claim. Any veteran actually getting this where you were mistreated that way and you haven't achieved that goal, uh, you know, you may want to consider, you know, doing a supplemental claim to reopen or something like that, you know, food for thought. Um, let's see here, Vincent. Vincent writes, good question. So how much do the office's budget and resources impact their decision making? I have been told that they do on a percentage, like I don't know a percentage, but I know of some offices that have made decisions based on dollar signs only uh, in multiple regional offices. So I am certain that that's true, a hundred thousand percent. So I just don't have a, um, I don't know the exact uh, mechanisms at this time. Question four, uh, in regard to my previous questions, uh, who would I need to speak to for accountability? I would rather not waste it. Okay, so accountability don't hold your breath okay we're seeing federal accountability before us on the news every single day is the federal government accountable no does congress even have a lot of success reigning in the federal government in the executive branch no so don't count on it don't uh lose any sleep over it it's just it's is what it is there are a few things that you can do that I'm probably going to start training veterans on at this point because I'm sick of it. And uh, it should be effective. So we'll just leave it at that until I roll out this uh, other platform. So <laughs> just leave it there for now. Um, let's see here. Another veteran. I was found entitled to VRNE to be a social worker, but I've already completed my first two years of the program. Before via self pay okay but i've been um am i eligible okay um so the answer here is uh, i don't know i think probably you know it's worth asking so at the end of the day um there's kind of a rule of thumb with retro uh and this is i'm paraphrasing it so if you have a specific question do your own legal research this is not legal advice. This is me kind of extrapolating and giving educational information. It's up to you to, you know, seek legal counsel if you need it, you know, all that stuff. But, um, but for retro, you want to go to uh, 38 CFR 21.282. This is real specific. But generally, the rule of thumb is 
if you were going to school outside of VRE and otherwise could have been entitled to VRE, but you weren't using it for that reason, or something happened, maybe you were wrongly denied and went, continued with training, you know, something like that. Anyway, point is, if you're continuing on and um, basically ask, put it in writing, again, with VRE, put it in writing, tell them you think that it should be retroactive, retroactive induction applies. If you paid for it out of pocket or however you paid for it, uh, VRNE should uh, give you retro in that context for whatever courses that you took toward the current approved plan. So if the current approved plan is to be a social worker or something like that, licensed clinical social worker or something, then the courses that you took toward that should be, if they were reasonably required, it should be, you know, you should be able to at least try to get retro. So that, I've done that quite a bit with my clients um, when we're doing appeals and successful. So it's something to think about. Uh, then another veteran asks, um, yeah, I mean, this could help. So veteran, yeah, veteran centers. I think that, that between them and finance, so if finance offices and also the vet centers were aware. So maybe that's something I could that may make sense. So, I'll, so yeah, this is probably not a bad idea. So uh, maybe if it me means me like speaking directly or, you know, who knows. But anyway, not a bad idea. So next we have a lot of questions here that are good. Is it normal to wait two months for initial interview? I got Eva within two days. Of, okay. Um, so right now I've heard that their staffing is low. So a lot of offices, it's taking forever. Uh, like one, what well, somebody wrote in, it was like four or six months, uh, something crazy. Uh, so yeah, some offices are running behind big time. So another one, uh, would it be better to just start using my GI Bill while waiting for VRD? I was told you can get it back. So um, yeah, so I, I've had situations where a veteran has their GI Bill replenished fully and then um, can get it later. You know, a lot of different different variables. So Yes, that can be, you know, again, I, I can't guarantee an outcome and I never would, but I have seen it for other veterans. So that suggests to me that it's a possibility, you know, to get the GI Bill replenished and uh, to be reimbursed for all of their, you know, related costs and stuff like that, tuition, you know. Let's see here. So another veteran says, uh, so far I've been pretty lucky with my counselor graduate in May 2024 with BS in computer forensics. Currently a LPN, so I'm, I'm not sure. I'm assuming it means a licensed nurse, but maybe not. Looking for jobs in new field. Uh, but... Okay, so I'm required. I'm not sure. Uh, okay, just a veteran talking about being lucky. Okay, so let me turn this on its head, though. Okay, so you may feel lucky with the BS, and I saw this recently with another veteran. But did you know that if you had a serious employment handicap, VRE is supposed to consider you for higher level training? Uh, in, in certain circumstances, you're supposed to be approved for not just what is generally considered necessary or required to get you into uh, a job at an appropriate level, not entry level, mind you, but appropriate level, which is not going to be entry level for most veterans, much less disabled veterans, for Pete's sake. Uh, but in addition to that, um, you should be able to at least request, and, and if they say no, fine, put it in writing. Make sure that you put the request in writing, uh, sign, date it, send it into the VRC with your social security number on it, make sure it gets into your claims file. Uh, but then in addition to that, it could be possible to get a master's degree or at least some additional certs, maybe just a master's degree plus certs, which I have seen uh, veterans get approved for. Um, because one thing to remember with a, a BS in computers as your body degrades, like most of ours do, because we've been exposed to toxins and pumped full of mystery vaccines and other things, that uh, we will have problems with our muscles, tendons, backs, discs, knees, you know, other things, brains, you know, we're going to have lots of problems, you know, serving our country came at a significant cost, even if you didn't know it at the time, uh, but later in life, you know, develop a mystery MS or ALS or something like that, you know. 
uh, which I think it's uh, is it ALS or MS, one of the two, is considered presumptive to every veteran if you get the condition. And they just won't explain why that might be. And I think, you know, some of us might know why. But uh, anyway, that's a conversation for another day. But anyway, so this veteran here is an example saying, hey, I got a good counselor. I got lucky. They approved me for a BS. Why not a master's degree? Why not additional certs? You know, are you in this era going to be able to compete against non-disabled, non-veterans who are younger and more, I guess I would call it malleable, right, than most, you know, veterans tend to be, um, you know, who will just take yes for yes and no for no. Most veterans no longer do that, at least to some degree. Uh, maybe in their own families when it comes to people in authority like a VA, maybe not. But anyway, point is that if you are a, um, yeah, so whoever the person is, so so you, I'm glad you responded. So, so the answer here is yes. So for you, if you're already kind of in nursing, but your disabilities are, are severe, I, if you were rep represented by me and you had the right to hire an attorney at first, which you don't, <laughs> but if you did, you know, like in any other country that claims to be uh, governed by a constitution, um, then I would have steered you towards probably uh, becoming a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner or doctor, right, first, because those are types of positions in a similar area that have greater control and potentially less ability to aggravate your disabilities. That's what I might have done first. I would have looked there. Then second, I, you know, if you did really want to get into forensics, which is cool, forensic computing, um, then I still would say, well, why not get an MBA and that, or an MA or an MS in certain things related to it to then really make you competitive because that's what VRE is supposed to do for veterans with a serious employment handicap. A serious employment handicap, if you don't know what that is, can be found at 38 CFR 21.52. Now, what's listed there is not maybe a full explanation of how it's going to go down in an adjudication, but it should give you enough to know uh, how it works, okay? And what VRE should have done, but maybe didn't. But the general gist of it is, a person with an employment handicap only is a person who's got a vocational impairment versus a significant vocational impairment. That's really the only difference. So significant is general, what does that mean? Well, if you look it up in the dictionary, it usually means something like it is uh, capable of detection and a few other things, right? Whereas what's the opposite of significant? Well, is it just insignificant? Well, I mean, you can make an argument for it. It's maybe not an exact logical jump, but um, but I, you, I would make that argument, you know, um, if I don't have any other position because, well, what is the opposite? What is, what is not significant, not significant, insignificant, right? So, uh, that would be in, incapable of perception. Whereas almost every veteran, uh, has a disability who has a disability, uh, their disability is capable of perception. Otherwise you wouldn't have it in most instances. And that's going to be a functional limitation. Now, not all functional limitations are vocational impairments, but all vocational impairments are usually functional limitations. I think that's the order, right? Something like that. Anyway, you get where I'm going with it. So there's some word salad there, but basically the gist of it is if you have a serious employment handicap, then they have to consider you for higher level training. And there's a bunch of criteria about why. There's three different, different things. This can be found in 38 CFR 21.72. Read that regulation closely and ask yourself, did my VRC disclose this this way? So take that regulation and couple it with 38 CFR 21.1, which is VRD purposes, and ask yourself, are these aligned? You know, was my experience consistent with this or not? You know, if it wasn't, you may have a strong odds of an appeal. Maybe not, but, you know, it's something to look at, you know, uh, and the more you know, the better off you are. So then Mo says, VRNE approved goal number one, clinical psychologist, which is awesome, but will not see me through licensure and states that postdoc fellowship is suitable work, even though it's training. Is that normal? So first of all, that is normal. Is that correct? 
No. <laughs> so uh, uh, becoming a clinical psychologist is you can't be that in most instances without being licensed. You can't be licensed without having completed a certain amount of training, which usually includes a residency of some kind. So I, I've worked on this actually, this issue model for another veteran and we were successful. So it happens, uh, VRE is trying to get out of the final steps of making sure professionals, uh, veterans who want to be aspiring professionals, actually make that leap. It's really sad. So we get veterans who go through law school, for example, there's one veteran in the group here that's talked about it quite a bit, uh, where they were approved for law school, but apparently not for the uh, appropriate um, bar prep to become a licensed attorney. Well, there's, there's no, really no such thing as an unlicensed attorney. <laughs> You're, you can't really say that, you know. Um, I guess you could say it, but you might get yourself in trouble. Um, because an attorney usually conveys that you're attorney at law, which means that you have a license to practice. It means you're authorized by somebody to do what you're doing. And you can't even work at the VA unless you're licensed, usually, if you're, if you're trying to get a job there as, a, as a, an attorney. You have to be licensed at least somewhere, normally. Um, so the point is that if the VRC is telling you this, then I would demand to get it in writing and have them deny you happy we're happy to look at it if you want us to look at it i don't we don't charge for case emails so just come on over you know you can <laughs> if you have questions we're here to help so you know um there's no reason to go it alone anyone watching this you don't have to go it alone we have a great facebook group that's a free resource you jump on in there uh you just got to fill out the questions that are at the beginning uh and then if you need you know uh, you want a legal eye to look over a bad decision happy to do it we do it for free I don't you know I don't know why more veterans don't try to get help especially free help you know uh, but whatever it is what it is so uh, anyway so then Sarah writes back same with social workers you need a master's degree to become licensed right so a licensed clinical social worker so it's something that you know uh, VRE is trying to get out of you know in, in a lot of ways so you know, trying to save a buck on the back of vets, but we're more than happy to spend $60 billion on IT to these same government contractors that couldn't fix it to begin with. So that's fine, $60 billion for that. Meanwhile, the, the, the budget for VR&D is like, what, $1.8 billion, if we're lucky? You know, but, oh, we need more IT that doesn't work, so we're going to continue to, you know, shill out billions of dollars to these contractors and never seem to show up with a proper solution. Uh, so it, there's, you know, the VA is here, they say it's for veterans, but I really, I think it's more of a handout for uh, worker populations and uh, consultants to make a lot of money. That's what it looks like to me. You know, we, we keep seeing the same contractors that used to be senior leaders at VA, then get hired into the, the government contractor, who then comes back and charges cajillions to do the same thing that the same leader was supposed to fix when they were at the VA to begin with. So... It's uh, just crazy. Um, so another one, can you believe their denial decision letter listed suitable work for a non-license was to be a VRC? That's kind of dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry that they said that to you. Um, because you're right, it doesn't require a doctorate. Um, and if you don't want to be a VRC, but you want to be a, you know, clinical psychologist, that's a different thing, you know. Uh, but yeah, no, that's that's stupid. And in many instances, they still want you to have a. Um, well, first of all, do you really want to work at the VA? F no, in my opinion. But you know, that's just my take on it. Uh, as having been somebody who works against VA regularly, but not inside VA. So that's just you know, one of those things. They'll they'll talk to me whenever they need feedback on how to fix broke stuff. But aside from that, they, they don't want to give me credit for it, and they certainly don't want me to get paid like the, you know, the Booz Allens of the world and Deloitte and all the other big uh, government contractors, McKinsey and Company, you name it. You know, those guys, yeah, they're, they're legit, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, anyone that's been through it that has real-world knowledge that could actually fix stuff, no, we don't want them. 
they don't know how to play golf well enough, you know. It would be embarrassing at the you know, country club, you know. Probably have a three over par or something. Ridiculous, you know. Anyway, I hope all y'all are well. Uh, I'm going to – I don't always wrap these up with a prayer, but I kind of feel like it's legit right now. I don't know why. So anyway, uh, dear Lord, thank you so much for everybody on this call. We ask that everybody on this call, um, that all of the obstacles that are facing them when it comes to their benefits or personal life or work, or whatever it is, that those obstacles get lifted and that their eyes be fixed on the solution and that they reach out for that solution and actually solve the problem. Or that they are led to get help from people that can help. Either way, Lord, we ask that you uh, provide uh, our country with the veteran leaders that it needs desperately and uh, help us to blow th through these roadblocks that uh, our federal government has put in place uh, that keep us from you know, achieving success and from being the leaders that our country needs us to be, uh, we thank you, Lord, for everything you give us and have given us to this point. Amen. All right, folks. Good luck with everything, and uh, God bless. And until then, um, you know, good luck. You know, it's, it's a jungle out there, so take care for now. Oh, geez. Uh, sure, I say that, and somebody's like, <laughs> I'm dealing with McKinsey at work. <laughs> Yeah. You know, the VA hires McKinsey uh, and their business uh, insurance uh, professionals to teach VA how to do, you know, what be a better at being a great benefit, if you remember the movie Rainmaker. Anyway, uh, check it out if you don't recall. But I, uh, uh, yeah, look forward. Thanks, Vincent. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks, Sarah, too. And otherwise, uh, God bless. Take care. Have a good weekend. Okay. Bye.